Welcome to chapter 22 and welcome back to module 5. So in this chapter we are going to talk about kind of the middle age of stars. Once they have already formed, which we talked about in chapter 21, and before they go through their final death throes, which we will talk about in chapter 23 and 24. This particular video is going to focus on how star clusters help make sure that we are checking our understanding of stellar evolution and make sure that we understand what star clusters are um, because we will need them again in module six. Now, high mass stars have the shortest lifetimes. We mentioned that briefly in the previous video and this new image, very similar to the one that showed when stars were heading towards the main sequence as protostars, this is now showing us the times in years for different stars um, to leave the main sequence. At the top of this set of um, stars, we have a star of 15 solar masses and how it takes 10 million years uh, and 12 million years to leave the main sequence and become a red giant. If we look down at the sun, and this is, um, to be clear, this is the current age of that star. Um, so a star like the sun, for example, the first number that we're given off the main sequence is 7 billion years. That means that it is spending um, the previous 7 billion years up to that point right at roughly the zero age main sequence. And it doesn't get that far until about 10 billion years. And that's when it really starts to leave the main sequence and become a red giant as well. Now, all of these numbers are mostly from computer simulations. And so we wanna make sure we remember always that science is about having a hypothesis and testing it. So if we had a whole bunch of stars that all formed at the same time, we can test this hypothesis by watching which stars leave the main sequence first. We can do this using star clusters. Now, in order to be able to use star clusters, we need to make sure we understand them. And so we're going to make sure we understand the two main types of star clusters that astronomers have identified. There are also stellar associations and things are always more complicated than what we simplify them to, but we will focus on two types of star clusters. Now, one of these types is called an open cluster. The one shown on the image here uh, is nicknamed the jewel box. These open clusters don't last for very long. When we see them, it's because those stars have very recently formed together in the same stellar nursery, but those young stars are easily dispersed. There's not enough of them for gravity to really hold on to them and hold them together. So an open cluster by definition is young in age because as time goes by, those stars tend to move away. The sun, for example, very possibly formed in an open cluster of a couple dozen stars and has since um, had all of its siblings move away. The other main type of star cluster is called a globular cluster or globular cluster. These are much, much larger and they are much older. The reason why we can say that they are older is because when we look at the types of stars that are in them, there are no high mass stars still on the main sequence. Those high mass stars on the main sequence have already gone through their entire lives and they have died. This particular cluster is called Omega Centauri and the um, words here Omega Centauri are blue because they are a link. That will be a supplementary video that shows us what can happen if we zoom in on a patch of this um, very, very high mass uh, globular cluster and then sort these stars by their apparent color and apparent brightness. We end up with a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Now, the book has a whole bunch of information and a bunch of numbers that can be useful if you're trying to wrap your head around the key differences. But I do need us to understand that the biggest difference is that these globular clusters 
are up to a million stars, and so they are a countable number of them. There are a countable number of them in the Milky Way. There's about 150 in our Milky Way galaxy. We will talk in chapter 25 in the next module about the different parts of the galaxy, and we'll revisit the fact that globular clusters show up mostly in what's called the halo. Open clusters, there are thousands of these open clusters because they represent locations where star formation is happening. That tends to be in the disk of the spiral galaxy and in the specifically the spiral arms. You can look at all of these numbers, pause the video as much as you want to, or just reference the posted slides. Um, it's not essential that we memorize all of this, but so that we have an understanding of the vast differences between the mass scales for these things, the amount of stars that we're seeing, and the typical ages at the very bottom. We'll note that globular clusters tend to be red in color, and that is because, or more reddish orange than blue, and that is because the blue main sequence stars are the ones that have already died. They've already gone through their entire life cycle. So a lot of this same kind of information we'll think more about in Module 6, but this is the place to introduce it. Okay, now star clusters are extremely useful for us. And the reason for that is because they're a little tiny test ground. Every single star within that particular cluster formed in the same region of space at the same time. Stars are all the same age then within this star cluster, but we need to make sure that we really understand something that is probably common sense when we're not over-focused on astronomy. Age and lifetime is not the same thing. Stars have a lifetime, an expected lifetime, based on their mass, but stars can have any age when we look at them, right? Human beings have a expected lifetime, but if we go into a um, kindergarten classroom, all of those little kids are going to be the same exact age when we view them, and there will be a different age if we went and saw a high school classroom. A star cluster has a single number value age, no matter what types of stars are in that cluster. And extremely useful for us, because those star clusters are all physically together in space, they are all the same distance away from us, and so we can use their apparent brightness as roughly a stand-in for their true brightness and actually work to figure out the luminosity and the distance by looking at them on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. There's more details about this in the textbook, but these two facts are the very key part for us to understand their importance. Okay, so let's compare a young star cluster with an old star cluster. On the left here, out of these three different things on our slide, on the left, we have a hypothetical or computer-generated young star cluster. Now, we see that the red line here is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and that the high-mass stars, the ones that have very hot temperatures on the left and very large luminosities on the top, they are on the main sequence, but the low mass stars are not on the main sequence. I need us to recognize that that is because those low mass stars have not even had a chance to become stars yet. We are looking at protostars still. This is such a young cluster that stars are still in the process of contracting to try to turn on hydrogen fusion. When we look at an example star cluster, so NGC 2264 is the catalog number of the object that we're looking at in the center. When we look at this example star cluster, it is an open star cluster. It is newly forming. And when we plot the data points for those stars, those real data points, we see a very similar situation that we get a set of stars about halfway up that are on the main sequence but everything at lower mass is not, and that's just because they haven't made it to the main sequence yet. They haven't contracted enough to go from protostar to star. Now let's look at the other end of things. If we are trying to look at an old star cluster, 
This is 47-2 cani. It is a globular cluster. We mentioned that globular clusters in general are quite old. This one is roughly 4 billion years old um, or 5 billion years old. Now, on the left, again, we have a hypothetical Hertzsprung-Russell diagram showing a um, computer-generated diagram going through all of the physics and letting those stars evolve to a specific age where this particular one is 4 billion 240 million years old. 47 2 cani, when we look at the real stars in that, we see a very similar situation that there are no high mass stars, that in the middle of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, it looks like stars are leaving. Now again, we don't have arrows, but the reason that we know that these stars are leaving the main sequence is because they've had plenty of time to be able to form. What we are now seeing is stars, once they run out of fuel, they leave the main sequence and get a lot bigger, becoming red giants. The real stars, we see that same exact situation. The key thing here is that if we look at the place where those stars are still on the main sequence but are probably the next in line to leave, that is roughly where the sun is. The sun is about 6,000 degrees in temperature and has the luminosity of one, solar luminosity. And so that tells us that stars like the sun are just about to leave the main sequence. That helps us figure out how old that star cluster has to be. To be even more specific about it, we can have just three simplified examples of stars that are brand new. They finally all made it to the main sequence. And they start to leave the main sequence from highest mass down to lowest mass. The point at which that um, set of stars is leaving the main sequence is called the main sequence turnoff point and the expected lifetime of stars at the main sequence turnoff point tells us the age of those stars. I can um, kind of come up with an analogy that may be helpful to some of you. Let's say that you bought a whole bunch of produce. So onions and potatoes and avocados and apples, and you set them on your counter, okay? If they were all picked at the same time, they might all have the same age, but those different fruits and vegetables, they ripen at different points and they go bad at different times as well. If you wait long enough for the first one to go bad, the other ones might all look as if they are brand new but that gives you a sense of how long all of those groceries have been sitting on the counter. If you know that that particular vegetable is the first one that goes bad and it does so in about um, you know, four or five days, then you know that that's when you bought those groceries. It's the same kind of thing with these stars. They have all different lifetimes, but we're seeing which one is just going bad, and that tells us how old that whole set of um, stars are. So as you continue on in this module, and we will revisit star clusters in module six, make sure that you're asking questions if there's something that doesn't make sense here, because we're building on understanding, and star clusters are one of the best ways to test the different hypotheses and theories of stellar evolution. So I will see you in the next video.